Thank you for that nice introduction, Kerem. Although, so I'm a lawyer, but when people ask me these days, what do you do, or at least when I attend meetings, people actually mistake me for a communications person, which I'm delighted about, but I'm a lawyer by training. I actually don't remember anything I studied in law school anymore. <laughs> but let's see how I do this afternoon. So what I'm going to talk about, so the way Thomas and I divided uh, this conversation was for me to start by framing it more broadly about what we're looking at in terms of the future of human rights communications. And then we will delve more deeply uh, into a particular approach that we think, at least I think, is very well apt or prepared for what the future holds for us. So I will start with first looking at what does looking to the future mean in general for human rights, and then I will look at like possible futures for human rights communications. So the future of human rights communications and why foresight is an important muscle for us to train, an important skill for us to have. What do I mean when I say foresight? So foresight is basically informed reflection about our actions today working backwards from the future. Normally in our organizations we do strategic planning, right? But most of what we do in traditional strategic planning is we make decisions for the next three to five years based on what we've seen from history and what we experience today. But the thing is, what we know is based on the past, but our actions will inhabit the future. So the logic behind futures thinking or foresight is, if our decisions will inhabit the future, why not base those actions in what the future holds for us? And there's a systematic way to actually do this. And I'll basically walk you through some of those basic things. Why futures thinking? So in this presentation, I will interchange the terms foresight and futures thinking. The first one is futures thinking actually challenges the assumption that what we are doing now will continue to work. Because it never continues to work. We know the dynamic nature of change, especially at this era, basically since after mid, um, in the mid 1900s, that there's what people call a VUCA world. V-U-C-A, a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Everything is interconnected at a global scale, that what happens in Turkey today can actually have impacts in some city or place within the Philippines. That was never possible before. But with the interconnectedness that we have, our ability or inability to respond creatively or appropriately to what happens in our locality can have magnified effects in many other places. The second one is, through foresight, we are able to anticipate long-term threats and uncertainties before they become existential threats. Many of the things that we're looking at now, for example, the rise of populism, the right, populism didn't happen overnight, we know that, right? It didn't even happen in the last five or 10 years. I will show later an example how, in fact, it has been in the making for decades. But now we feel like, oh, there's this threat to our democracy, there's this threat to our way of being able to do human rights work, and had we used foresight in many of these spaces, we would have come to a point when we feel like it's a threat to our very existence, either as human rights workers or creative supporting human rights or social change work. The third one is, aside from preventing existential threats, there's also a very positive aspect of being able to look forward into the future, and that is to be able to see strategic opportunities that we can take advantage of today. And finally, the beauty of foresight is it can bring people together to create shared long-term vision. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, like economic forecasts, right? That's not what I mean by foresight. Because these economic forecasts are actually 
almost their, their claims of what tomorrow will be. They're based on quantitative data and they will say, oil will cost this much per barrel in the next three years. That's not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is more a qualitative process by which an entire organization comes together to really think about the future and create a preferred shared vision of the future. And I'm actually excited that, is it on Thursday? I can't remember, Thursday, Wednesday? We're doing uh, an organization-wide foresight workshop at Hafsa Merkezi. Uh, and this is, this inspires me a lot, this excites me, because it's an opportunity for the staff to come together. The future is a relatively safe space for conversations. If you get the same group of people to discuss what's going on in politics today, you'll have debates, right? But remove it by time, by 10, 20 years, and you can actually have safer, more civil, and perhaps more hopeful conversations. So aside from it helping our decision making today, it's actually a strategic opportunity to have a common dialogue with people that we may, with whom we may disagree. So two other reasons why we need foresight. How many of you here, when you make strategic plans, do you consider what's going on in the tech world? Great, we have one. How many of you consider what's going on in pop culture, like fashion, design? Excellent. How many of you are looking at what's going on in entertainment? Great. In the environment? And what's going on, say, in India? With foresight, we have to consider a global context and the context of other sectors we normally, we normally don't look at when we say if we work in civil society or human rights, we tend to the maximum extent to look at politics and maybe the societal aspect of things. But there's such a thing called STEEP, S-T-E-E-P. These are the different sectors or disciplines we look at. It's social, technological, economic, environmental, and political. Because the fact is, one affects the other. What happens in technology, or what has happened in technology, brought us right here where we are. The social media, the interconnectedness. Did you ever imagine for communicators who have been around since the last two decades or decade, that your work will look the way it does now? Had it not been for the great leaps we've done in technology and the regressions as well. And it's the same for pop culture, for entertainment, for fashion, and environmental change. So just to give you a very visual way of how we, how we do foresight, the process. So let's start, I, I advance it by one year. So let's say we're in 2020 because it's an easier number to deal with than 2019. So it's like really having that telescope here in 2020 while you're trying to make decisions today. And to be able to make the good decisions today, you look forward 10 years out. We never use a three year or five year, much less two year timeline for foresight because too short term doesn't allow us to really look broad and get beyond the assumptions that we have that what we have today can just be linearly projected into the future. So we do it, usually the sweet spot, like the, um, the Institute for the Future in Silicon Valley, they use a 10 year term. Sometimes depending on your goal as an organization, you can look to 20 years, say if you're dealing with issues like climate change. Um, or sometimes it could be 30 years. The problem with doing it much longer than that is it becomes almost like science fiction, right? But if you do it too short, then it's business as usual. So from 2020, we look forward to 2030. And then, but to be able to actually come up with a meaningful set of possible futures in 2030, you have to look backwards and study history and what we have today and making our actions today based on that complete, almost like triangulation of those different parts of the timeline. But why is futures thinking hard? Thinking about the future is hard for three reasons. 
Actually, there are many, but I chose only three. The first one is biologically, or at least neuroscientifically, we see our future selves as if they're strangers. So they've actually scanned brains of people, and they were asked to think about their current selves. When you think about your current selves, your prefrontal medial cortex, which is the part of the brain that is activated when you think of something or someone familiar, is activated. But when you think of your future self, it's that part of the brain that thinks of strangers that is activated. Can you actually imagine yourself like 20 years from now? You can, but do you feel a certain kind or the same sense of urgency or empathy or concern for that 30 year self than for yourself today or tomorrow? So how can you feel the urge or the concern or the commitment to think about something that's a stranger to you. The second reason is, and this is important, middle and upper classes, we tend to assume that society is relatively static. We might deny that, but science and studies have proven that. It's actually people from lower economic rungs because they're used to, to the insecurity of tomorrow that assume that things will change any minute. But those who, who are in the middle upper classes, even if we don't realize it unconsciously, we think that change may happen tomorrow, but it will merely be almost a linear projection of what we have today. So why will you be concerned about tomorrow if you actually know more or less how it's going to be? And finally, there's this thing called cognitive anchoring. So we work, Thomas and I work with a really awesome neuroscientist and she said that 40 to 90% of what we do is unconscious. 40 to 90, up to 90%. We think we're conscious most of the time, but in fact we respond to stimuli and the brain receives around 11 million bits of information per moment, but we can only process 40, not 40 million, but 40 and we receive 11 million bits. So how does the brain process that? We create mental shortcuts by creating or remembering patterns. So in fact, when you receive a stimulus, like apparently it takes a split second to be able to catalog a person's gender or race. And then your brain tells you, okay, this person is um, of African descent, this means that this person is this and that. It's unconscious completely. And so, because of these mental patterns, which is our brain's way of adapting to so much information, we anchor ourselves in these like patterns to make it easy for us to process information that when we're given new information, we still treat that new information within our existing mental frameworks. And who are particularly bad at this cognitive anchoring? It's experts. And I, 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 did you call me an expert? I don't know how the translation was. I was like, oh, I'm an expert. Uh, experts, I don't know if you've seen the book. It's a very recent book called Range by David Epstein. I highly recommend it if you haven't. He basically says that it's generalists or people who come from several fields at the same time or are exposed to different disciplines that are able to really change the world or may push or engineer social change more than experts. Because when you have a very narrow expertise, you're trained in that and your mental frameworks and models are very entrenched that no matter what the world tells you, no matter what others tell you, you process that information using the exact same model, even if it actually doesn't work. So, I'm gonna give you some examples of experts and their cognitive anchoring. The first one, this is an actual line, huh? I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Guess who said this? Do you know? It was Thomas Watson, the chairman of IBM, he said this in 1943. Expert on computers, right? Next one. We don't like their sound, and guitar music is on their way out anyway. This was by, oh sorry, 
this was by Decca Recording Company when they rejected the Beatles in 1962. Guitar music is on its way out in the 60s. This one. There is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. This was by one of the engineers in the Advanced Systems Division of IBM commanding on the first microchip. And finally, this is my favorite. 640K of RAM or computer memory ought to be enough for anybody. It was Bill Gates in 1981. Not because they're stupid, they're brilliant people, but we're built, we're entrenched in a lot of our cognitive frameworks that it's hard to get out of them. Foresight forces you to broaden your perspective both at the geographical and disciplinary or sectoral uh, level. An important thing that I always tell people, I remember we actually started this conversation, I started this conversation with you guys I think two years ago when I first proposed how about we do a futures thinking workshop at Hafsa Marquesi and the first question by them and by everyone is but how can you predict the future, especially in Turkey? Are you kidding me? We don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? But foresight is not about predicting the future. I'm going to say it and I'm going to say it over and over. This is not the economic forecasting or uh, technological modeling that we're used to. It's about looking at potential futures to be able to make strategic decisions today regardless of what scenario comes to pass. That's why in Foresight we talk about futures with an S, meaning plural, and not one future. So what we do in Foresight is we look at the different like aspects or critical factors we need to consider and we create different scenarios around three or four of them. And the point is it doesn't matter which one of them actually comes to pass or even if none of them. The important thing is knowing these four possible futures, what does it mean for our decisions today so we can be prepared for any one of them or none of them. That is foresight. It's not about the accuracy of the prediction at all, but it's about the insight into our decision making today. So what do we look at in studying the future? The first one, trends. We know about this, right? The trends of, um, what do you call this, Instagram stars. The trend of artificial intelligence gaining citizenships, like there's the, this AI uh, robot that received a citizenship in Saudi Arabia, and we only see that perhaps increasing, that's a trend. Uh, basically these are more short-term things that have come to be of such level of occurrence that we know they're going to continue in the, sh the short-term future. But then, and those are the things that usually you think about that convinces you that you can't predict the future. Because trends change overnight, over a few months, and maybe in a year or two. But there are other things that we consider in studying the future. We call the much more longer term things drivers of change. So imagine the Earth, right? And the surface, the crust, is what we see. We have earthquakes, but those earthquakes are caused by tectonic plates underneath much thicker layers of the earth that is moving all of these. We only see the surface, but those tectonic plates have always been there, have been there for decades, and will persist for a longer time. An example of a driver of change would be um, much more network sharing of information. This has been happening for decades and we don't see it being reversed in the next few decades. So that's not a surprise, but often we forget to look at them and how they interact with more short-term trends. But my favorite of these different inputs are signals of change. What are they? Trends, you look at them, they are in the mainstream. Drivers of change, they're also like obvious. Like when I mentioned the driver of change, you're like, yeah, makes sense. But imagine you're reading the newspaper and you see in page 10 in a corner of the newspaper some weird article about something that happened in a different part of, say, the Caucasus. 
but it says something to you that if that fringe occurrence actually scales, it could change everything. It's looking at things happening today that you instinctively feel will take us into a new direction if it becomes a trend. So it's looking at the peripheries, at the fringes before they become mainstream. So you don't wait for it to become a trend. And I think this is one of the biggest gifts or skills or muscles that we can train as social change leaders or as decision makers. You know, instead of waiting for something to happen, you get ahead of the curve and you're able to tell that this might happen. So that no matter what life brings your organization or yourself, you're prepared for it because you weren't taken by surprise by something that you used to take for granted. An example of a signal of change is Narendra Modi, the president, or is it prime minister? Prime minister of India. We, we, we know him, this good looking gentleman. <laughs> and so I think it was a year ago that in one of his community rallies, he used a hologram of himself to appear at several different locations, communities in India, including rural areas, and he appeared in all of them at the same time as a hologram. If more leaders use that, can you imagine how that will change the face of direct democracy? and the direct interaction of leaders, populist or not, with the communities, right? So far, I haven't heard of anyone else doing that. But if you're reading that newspaper, it's just some like exotic news you read on page 12 in some, as in some, in some side part. Beyonce. But, yeah? Beyonce, Beyonce of course, Beyonce. Also, there is a Hatsune Miku, is a pop singer. In there is a Hatsune is the pop singer, is the hologram singer. Uh, people do his song mm -hmm. with uh, online, so maybe this yeah. is an example for. <laughs> yeah, and actually, this is a good thing because this has been used more in the entertainment sector, right? Especially in Japan, but and Korea, yes, Japan and Korea. But politicians using that—that that could be a really powerful or dangerous tool. So that is a signal of change. And this is my second example, another good-looking gentleman. <laughs> so we say that Trump, the Trump era, we all know that it didn't happen overnight, right? It happened over a few years. In fact, it didn't happen over the course of a few years. It happened over the course of decades. So I was reading this book entitled How Democracies Die by two professors at the Harvard Kennedy School. And while I was reading that, I was so shocked by something they said. They basically tried to trace how did we end up with this hot mess with this good looking guy. And it turns out there was a predecessor for Trump's era and that was this other good looking guy in 1978. His name is Newt Gingrich. He was a young relatively young Republican. It was in a Holiday Inn Hotel in the Atlanta airport. Very ambitious young politician, Republican. He came in and basically told the young Republicans in the room, okay guys, Boy Scout words that are nice about the Democrats are good around the campfire, but they're bad for winning votes. Before in the United States and in many parts of the world, you can have, you always have competing politicians for votes or competing, competing parties. In the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans have always been there. But they treated each other as legitimate opponents to one another. But it was Newt Gingrich who introduced into the vocabulary of American politics the ideas of fascists, terrorists, imprison them, that they delegitimize the other as not even worthy as an opponent. And before, you can have opponents within a legal system, like elections, that you recognize as legitimate. But remember Trump even did not want to recognize the results. He said, oh no, I actually think I want more votes. Right? Uh, let's ignore the political system. And many leaders are saying that. What? I didn't like the result of the municipal elections. Let's do another one. Before, there were rules of the game. There was civility in politics, at least in the United States. But now there's none. And it didn't start with Trump. 
It didn't start a de an administration before Trump. It started several decades before when there was a signal of change and we weren't looking. Do I still have you? I know it's that part of the day <laughs> where it's nice. So I live in Colombia where we have afternoon naps, so I should be napping right now. So. You got six minutes. I've got six minutes. Will you give you me a bit more time? Yeah. More, so foresight yeah. is being used in different parts of society. In corporations, definitely. In government, in military, and in climate. And there are different types of futures that they've come up with, like studies and foresight processes. There's future of the media, future of food, future of energy, of climate action, of human and machines, future of caregiving, future of wearables. I even found one on the future of the Episcopalian Church. But why are we not talking about the future of human rights, specifically the future of human rights communications? I'm going to skip through this. So last year, um, a colleague of mine and I published a book trying to come up. You can download it. It's free. It's called, what was it called? Uh, the, pop, the Rise of Populist. Rise there. Of the populist <laughs> That's the book. You can download it. It's PDF. And there's actually a case study from here. Um, it was our attempt to try and find like innovative actions against populism in different parts of the world. That, along with our work with actual organizations in different parts of the world, like this one. This is the executive director of the Australian Human Rights Law Center. There's the executive director of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, this team from Mexico, this team from, yeah, from Australia, and then from Venezuela, and yeah, from Hungary. And they're working basically just like the hackathon that Hafsa Merkezi just led. It was one human rights client, a human rights organization, who didn't have to pay for anything. We formed a team of non-human rights people, political strategists, people who run presidential campaigns, comms people who work in ad agencies, tech people who know computational propaganda, neuroscientists, to try and understand the challenge on narratives of the human rights client and to come up with solutions for them. It was in all of this that we realized how important and critical the issue of winning hearts and minds are in, in today's society. So I'm going to go now into the final part of my presentation, which is given all of this, both of the need for foresight in any part of society and what I've seen in my work as the critical developments in the different sectors, social, technological, environmental, et cetera, et cetera. What do I see are the potential futures that we're looking at? These are different types of organizations. We were used, this, this illustration actually represented the internet. The internet started as a centralized thing where you had one hub, imagine a router, by which everything was coursed. If that hub uh, broke down, everything else broke down. And they realized that's very vulnerable. They created the decentralized system. So imagine organizations. Now we have a lot of decentralized organizations. Organizations supposedly like Amnesty International, I don't know, Thomas, if you agree with that, um, Human Rights Watch, are beginning to decentralize and have offices in the Global South. And then there's a distributed type of organization where not only do you have different spokes, those different spokes actually coordinate and exchange with one another. But that's not the future. If you happen to read this book called um, The Ten Leadership Literacies by this great futurist called Bob Johansson, he says that the future of organizations will look like this. They're called shape-shifting organizations. So imagine a fishnet. And when you lift one part of the fishnet, that part is lifted up, right? But then it comes down at some point, and then another part is lifted up. He says that the future of organizations will look like that, where there's no central leadership, there's no fixed central hubs, and innovation will come from the fringes, and you can't control it. His best examples are terrorist networks and criminal gangs, but he says that by the nature of how innovation has been working globally that are not determined by geography, this is the kind of organizing we're looking at not in the next 20 years, but possibly in the next 10 years. What does that mean for you executive directors in this place? What does that mean for the way we even conceive of funding organizations? 
or organizing social change work. So in that future, according to Bob Johansson, there will no, no more be rock star leaders. But network leadership of humble and strengthened quality. Because leadership will be shared across different people who may come from very different sectors or disciplines. There will be hyper collaboration. And by collaboration, not only within your field, but with people who don't even speak your language of human rights. Much like what we're trying to do working with people from different disciplines. And the term or framework human rights might not even be the framework used anymore. And we see that more and more. I don't know if you've seen the piece by the former UN Special Rapporteur, Philip Alston. He said, he's a human rights advocate himself, but he said, we shouldn't be too precious with the framework human rights if it's not the most effective framework that wins hearts and minds and gets social justice to be realized. Maybe it's a framework of equity, social justice, justice, and I might say a framework of kindness, empathy, and openness. We don't have to be precious. I know that's hard, especially for people who worked for decades for these treaties to be approved, to be ratified, but if we hold on to that past, we miss the opportunities of what the future holds for us. There will be fluid boundaries of what is considered human rights. Before, when I'm in these international meetings and some people say, but we're not working on human rights, we're working on climate. And to me, it's like, well, that's necessarily about human rights too. Well, I'm not working on human rights, I'm working on gender. I'm a feminist. Well, what do we really mean by that? In the future, in the very near future, those boundaries or silos will be even less relevant. There will be even greater competition for attention. How many of you here are communications experts working in ad agencies? Okay, I have one, two, okay. An, uh, one and a half, right? <laughs> okay, so you know that it's so hard to compete for attention of people because there's a barrage of information coming at them from whatever platform. How many of you have heard of the idea or the concept Internet of Things, IOT? Yes, great. So Internet of Things is when basically, it, this is not science fiction, it's already happening, it will happen more in the next five years where your microwave oven will be connected to the internet, right? Your washing machine will have a chip that will connect it to the internet and the manufacturer. So your washing machine will actually be able to record how many times you wash, do you wash at such temperature, what, what, uh, what washing powder you use, etc. All of that data will come to somewhere that will be used to either aim marketing to you and also that will be used to basically predict, predict your behavior. There, and then this information that you put in these things that will be connected to one another will also be vomited back to you. And the future of communications will actually be not that you're looking at a screen and you get the information. The future, and this was in a conversation that we had in Palo Alto, was that our clothing might actually be this. So if you want to watch news, maybe you don't have to watch a screen. You just see it in your clothing or it's there right in front of you like in those sci-fi movies. So if we think that there's so much information coming at people now, <laughs> you can't imagine what it will be in the next 10 years. What does that mean for communicating a message? One message amongst millions of them every day to people around the world. And the future most likely will not be lawyer dominated. I'm a lawyer myself, but we know the trajectory of how it became lawyer dominated after the Cold War when we needed to establish international standards for human rights, it was necessarily these standards were law and they were led by lawyers. Most executive directors of many human rights organizations are lawyers, but they will most likely, these organizations, be led by those who don't even identify as human rights activists. The youth especially, millennials and generations, generation Z, or uh, the iGen generation, Many of them are activists, but they don't necessarily call themselves human rights activists. They're cause activists, right? And so with all of that, I leave you with this. So Ian Morrison, a futurist, developed the concept of the second curve. Some of you might be aware of this. It's how innovation and adapting or taking advantage of innovation works. And this is the main challenge to all of us. There is a first curve. 
That's the way of doing things today. But at some point it will come down and there will be some residual, uh, residual assets that you can still salvage from the way we're doing things today. The way we've been doing things today have been so impactful, but at some point they will have less impact. And then at some point, the second curve will kick in. I, sorry. The second curve will kick in, where from today's innovations, they will become more established, that they will become tomorrow's way of doing things. The challenge for any manager or organization is finding that sweet spot whereby you jump into the second curve before it's too late. So my final message to you is, what I've just talked to you about the future of human rights communications shouldn't get you afraid, should get you excited but also really alert. When do I make it to the second curve so I don't become a laggard at taking advantage of change? So, it's too late to catch up, but it's always a great time to leapfrog. Thank you.